Good morning and welcome to the 22nd Annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oratorical Competition hosted by the Alpha Alpha Lambda Scholarship and Educational Foundation of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. My name is Brian Agnew and it has been my distinct honor to co-chair this year's program as we transitioned like many other organizations from in-person to virtual while ensuring the integrity, the excellence, the passion and energy conveyed through these vibrant young minds. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jada Holliday, a senior at Baylor University who will perform her rendition of the Negro National Anthem, which has garnered almost 100,000 views on YouTube. Good morning and congratulations to our seven finalists today. Our voice is still one of the most powerful tools that we can use in our quest for justice and equality. Each day we have the opportunity to speak out and stand up for what is right. So when we sing songs like our Negro National Anthem, we affirm our commitment to the continued fight for justice and freedom for all of humanity. In 2021, we will still sing, still pray, still dream, and still hope. Thank you, Dr. Agnew and the Brothers of Alpha Phi Fraternity for this amazing opportunity to present Lift Every Voice and Sing by James Weldon Johnson.
Good morning. My name is Brother Mark Hassel, and I'm the chairman of the Alpha Alpha Lambda Scholarship and Educational Foundation. I would like to welcome you to the 22nd annual Martin Luther King Oratorical Contest. What a year we've had. What a difference a year has made. Last year, we held this event at Essex County College in a grand hall for the largest crowd we ever had to view the oratorical contest. This year, things are different. We had to adjust, use a different playbook, deal with the uncertainty of the times. We knew we couldn't present the event in the same format as previous years. We reconfigured it, reimagined it, realigned it to fit the current protocols set forth by the state of New Jersey with regards to safety during the pandemic. The young men have worked tirelessly these past few months to develop and tweak their oratories for today. I want to give thanks to our chapter, Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter, and our president, Brother Delio Adapo, for supporting and fully supporting us through these changes and new endeavors. Our chairpersons for the event are brothers Dr. Brian Agnew and Brother Mark Smith. They did a tremendous job conceptualizing and designing the event to adhere to those protocols. The Alpha Alpha Lambda Chapter Scholarship Fund Educational Foundation is a charitable arm of Alpha Alpha Lambda Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, based right here in Newark. The foundation provides two scholarships for graduating students of Essex County College who are going on to, to do their coursework at four-year universities and institutions. Those scholarships are given in the memory of brothers Ferdinand D. Williams, and Brother Sidney Johnson. We have another scholarship, the Brother Michael Marion B. Frederick Scholarship, that is given to a graduating high school senior to assist with their continued education in college. Our newest scholarship, the Brother Michael Machoki Scholarship, is given to one of our undergraduate brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated who are active in a chapter that Alpha Alpha Lambda supports and advises. We use the term heroes in many different ways. We talk about heroes in relation to our military servicemen and women. We use it to describe our first responders. This year, we added our healthcare workers to that list of heroes. They, through their enormous amount of struggle and strength and perseverance, took care of all of us during the pandemic. They saw and performed tasks that they had never done before, and in some cases, had not been trained for. Yet, they still did it anyway, day in and day out. I think another group that needs to be added to that list of heroes is our teachers. Our military protects our borders. Our first responders protect our cities and homes. Our healthcare workers protect our mental health and physical health but our teachers protect our future. And they have done a remarkable job as well, dealing with the challenges they were not prepared for either. Whether it being going virtual or hybrid, whatever it was for that day, they adapted and did it admirably. So we need to add them to the list of heroes. It's through our teachers that the young men today will be able to communicate for tomorrow. Their teachings have helped our young men prepare for those coming days. With that, we will watch seven finalists today because this is our future. These seven will one day be our military leaders, our first responders, healthcare workers, and our teachers. With that, I turn it back over to Dr. Brian Agnew, who will provide more information about the events of today. Thank you for watching the 22nd annual Dr. Martin Luther King Oratorical Contest. Be caring, be safe, be blessed. For those of you who are with us for the first time, this year's cycle began in the fall with a challenge to seventh and eighth grade young men from Essex County to respond to the prompt, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s perspectives on the world today. 
46 video submissions were judged, and based on their scores, today's seven advanced to the final round. Our presentations are being judged live today based on the following 10 criteria. Opening, logic, creativity, eye contact, voice diction, originality, appearance, preparedness, effectiveness, and time. Having the difficult job of judging today's competition are three esteemed brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. The first, Brother Leonard Jones, is a civil litigation attorney with Chazen, Lamparello, Mallon, and Capuzzo PC. Focusing his practice on contracts, governmental entity representation, labor and employment law, and represents individuals, municipalities, counties, authorities, and school boards in various litigation and compliance matters arising under New Jersey's Tort Claims Act. He also holds the distinct honor of being the 12th and youngest brother to be appointed District Director of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated for the District of New Jersey. Our second judge today, Brother Paul Murdoch, is the founder and managing director of MCG Consulting, a leading compliance practice supporting the finance interest industry globally. A longtime member of the Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter, he has served as past chapter president, vice president, director of education, and director of membership intake. In 2017, he was recognized with the coveted honor of being named the chapter's brother of the year. Our third judge today, Brother Marvin Pettis, is a litigation partner at Quinteros Prieto Wood and Boyer, the largest minority law firm in the United States. In addition to a stellar trial record of 110 to 10, Brother Pettis teaches trial advocacy to new practitioners and law students at various venues, including the National Bar Association, Hofstra Law School, Freed Frank, Brooklyn Legal Services, Albuquerque Legal Services, and Seton Hall Law School. Brother Pettis is the immediate past chair of the Alpha Alpha Lambda Scholarship and Educational Foundation and has been a committed member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity for over 38 years. With those introductions complete and without further ado, I present to you in alphabetical order our seven finalists. The first presenter is Noah Akinoye, a seventh grader from South Orange Middle School in South Orange. Until I was eight years old, Barack Obama was the only president I'd ever known. Every year that I can remember, my parents would take me into the curtained electronic voting booth and I'd help them push buttons, press enter, and then leave. And every year of my childhood, my life seemed stable, just like our presidency. Outside of that, I never thought of the importance of voting much until the 2016 election. That's when I began to understand why it was so important, so necessary. We had to do this or else someone horrible could end up running the country. I remember my mother and I canvassed in the crucial swing state of Pennsylvania for hours on election day, going door to door in Allentown just to prevent America from falling to pieces. The next morning, we found out Trump won. We were horrified. I was sobbing, though. I don't know why, as at eight years old, I was seemingly too young to process this. Maybe I cried because mom and dad were upset. Maybe I cried because I knew that by canvassing and by getting out the word, we had tried to prevent whatever mom and dad were so upset about. Or maybe I was crying because I knew already that because not enough people had spoken up and used their voice, the next president was going to make our lives, especially the lives of black and brown people, a four year long horror movie. Over the next four years, life progressed. Well, I can't say normally, but like I said, face lies and got up close and personal with the, one of the most horrible men to walk the planet. Then one day I thought America, true America, could not have elected this man. Maybe it wasn't that not enough people used their voice. Maybe it's that too many people's voices were silenced. 
Voter suppression is where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. fought against in 1965. On the day known as Bloody Sunday, organized by him and other civil rights leaders, hundreds of people sacrificed their bodies to make sure that in the future, others would have their voices heard. They wanted an end to the literacy tests and poll taxes and all the other things that racist county clerks would come up with just to prevent black people from voting and exercising their civil right. This was one of the many marches held in Selma in support of the Voting Rights Act, and yet here we are more than 50 years later, and we are still fighting the same battle. In 2013, a major portion of the groundbreaking Voting Rights Act of 1965 that Dr. King and so many others had worked towards was gutted by the Supreme Court. I wonder how horrified would he be to see so much of his work undone? What would he say about the continued effort by conservatives afraid of change and politicians afraid of losing power towards voter suppression? How would you feel about the felony disenfranchisement in Florida? About there being only one ballot drop-off location in the entire city of Houston? How would he feel about police pepper spraying a crowd including children, children as young as three years old, peacefully marching to the polls in Graham, North Carolina? Just how appalled would he be to see his country being torn apart? When I sat down to write the speech about how your voice can be used and how it can be taken away, I was reminded of a quote by Dr. Martin Martin Luther King Jr., when he vowed to keep taking a stand on voting rights until the issue was truly, truly fixed. He said, let us march on ballot boxes until race baiters disappear from the political arena. He said, let us march on ballot boxes until the salient misdeeds of bloodthirsty mobs are transformed into the calculated good deeds of orderly citizens. So the answer to those earlier questions, he would be horrified, but he would say something about it. He would keep marching. This year, on November 7th, when the results of this year's election came in, I learned an important lesson. If enough people use their voice, others will hear them. This election, people voted in record numbers. Over 156 million people filled out their ballots, each trying to push America in a different direction. Enough people used their voice that America was back to championing its core values of progress, equality, diversity, and inclusivity. That day, people were shouting in the streets, rejoicing at the victory for America. Cars drove by honking, by Don and dump Trump signs jutting from their sunroofs. Biden won came voices from the rooftops. America had spoken. And despite the obstacles, we had spoken. And for that, Dr. King would be proud. Thank you. Greetings. I'm Brother Willis Lanzer, General President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And today it is a pleasure for me to be a part of this virtual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. oratorical contest sponsored by the men of the Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter of Greater Newark and Essex County, New Jersey. The men of the Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter are reputable and they get things done. Their president, Brother Dele Oladapo, and our event co-chairs, Brother Brian Agnew and Brother Mark Smith, are to be commended for this great work along with the brothers of the chapter. For over 22 years now, these men have helped to shape the lives of young orators and these budding leaders by sponsoring an oratorical contest. Certainly, the very essence of who they are and incorporating it into the spirit of our own good brother, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a young leader who even got his way uh, as a young man graduating on from Morehouse College and going on to graduate school in Boston and becoming not only a great leader, but a great minister and a great orator in his own right. 
the work of these men and working with these young and seventh and eighth graders to me is an outstanding hallmark of what we do as Alpha Phi Alpha in supporting our communities and developing leaders, which is really a part of our entire mission as a fraternity. Today, I wish our competitors great luck as they go in and try and work it out with each other and deliver some outstanding speeches, I know. But I also want to thank the parents today for your continuing support of your young people. Alpha Phi Alpha believes in our communities. And today, your presence, both virtually and those if you are there in spirit too, which I know you are, will make this great event a success. Wishing you all a continued happy 2021 and be safe and healthy and have a wonderful event and day. Thank you. Next, we have M.D. Chowdhury, an eighth grader from Mount Vernon Elementary School in Newark. Good morning. My name is M.D. Chowdhury from Mount Vernon School in Newark, New Jersey. Today, I would like to put myself in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s shoes on what he may think about the world today. Never would I have thought in a millennium that a pandemic of this intensity would occur. I robustly believe this year is a crucial step for humanity. The world demanded that we stop relaxing immediately and get working again. I see this year as a wake-up call to all of us who are so used to taking things for granted. It has conveyed that the life we know can be taken out in the blink of an eye. We must persevere during these tough times. And now that the vaccine for COVID-19 has come out, we still must follow guidelines. And as for those who are making a mockery of this, I hope you find guidance somewhere and somehow. You can do your part by wearing masks, social distancing, and washing your hands thoroughly with soap and water. Moving forward, I would like to convey my sincere condolences to those who have lost a loved one to this horrific and dismal virus. My prayer and hope is that since the presidential election is over, with the new president-elect, Mr. Joe Biden, and the vice president-elect, Kamala Harris, the first, Afri the first vice president woman of color, there will be a healing of minds as well as healing between the various political parties in America, regardless of race, religion, or ethnicity. We must look beyond our differences and work towards creating more jobs for minority groups, find cures to diseases that hurt and destroy families, and create more scholarships for minority students to go to universities and achieve higher levels of education. On the date of August 28th, 1963, I elaborated on racial justice and equality for all. I wanted the world to prosper into a beautiful sanctuary for human beings to exist within. A world where you wouldn't be judged for your appearance. A world where your actions define how you are treated. A world where my family and I can live safely in, regardless of our skin color. I have seen the promised land. We have made such a massive step to what I foresaw. We will make the defining step to the utopia we fantasize about every single day. I feel so blessed to witness the revolutionary change amongst Americans today. Although many racial problems still linger, the change compared to back then is exponential. The riots and protests that took place earlier in 2020 were shameful. I was genuinely embarrassed looking at what acts were performed in the disguise of fighting for equality. I believe that those who peacefully protested were model citizens, and I am enthralled to see that they didn't act out of their line to commit any crimes to express their feelings. I am ashamed and utterly disappointed with those who rioted, broke into stores, looted, and burned companies owned by innocent people just to express their feelings. My protests and lead on civil rights should have exemplified that peaceful protests are indeed effective because it led us here. If you do not have empathy or compassion for others, you absolutely do not deserve to be treated respectfully. However, I do believe people can change and people need second chances. We are not perfect beings. We make constant mistakes that make us human. One specific topic that gripped my attention recently was the abundance of police brutality, which was also the cause for the death of George Floyd, a massive event that led to the immense uproar among the United States citizens of today. I think many things can be fixed with officers. And we can do that by creating a better qualification system and training program for officers all across the country. I staunchly believe 
that the officers will definitely benefit from learning new strategies with working with the regular public versus those hardcore career criminals that they have to deal with daily. I fervently believe that after the numerous marches and protests, each state in America should set up a committee to oversee the retraining of all the police officers. If this is done, things will change for the better as the years go by. In addition to how the world has drastically changed, the United States of America has one of the most diverse countries in the world. We now have people of various races all across the United States of America, representing that humans are all one. Immigration is a huge reason for this. The USA's entire purpose was to provide a progressive and safe environment for those who need to escape from the grueling, strict rules of their former country. I am very elated that this country has transformed so much. However, there is much more work to be done. The immigration process is also something that can be improved on because it is simply too restrictive. The last topic I want to elaborate on again is the elections. The elections this year were extremely different from before. Although the method of winning was still there, the method of voting was quite peculiar. We were trying to avoid contracting COVID-19. As a result, thousands of voters mailed in their ballots this year all across the United States. I believe that the two candidates could have changed America, but it depends on whether or not the effect is positive or negative. The new president-elect, Mr. Joe Biden, has a clear plan on what he wants to do and is more determined than ever to begin working to change the nation and begin working to work with scientists to find the safest and best vaccine for the entire country, not just for the wealthy people and per people with certain skin colors. This election is just another important stepping stone to the country we dream of every single day. My brothers and sisters, we can rest assured that the United States of America will be constantly changing in an upward direction. We have fought for equality for an extremely lengthy period of time, and we will continue to do so to make America into the sanctuary we want it to be. I believe, we believe, we all believe in the United States of America, and we must look beyond our differences and rise above the negative influences around us in order to achieve our collective goals and dreams. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Brother Deli Oladapo. I have the privilege and blessing of serving as the president of the premier chapter, Alpha Alpha Lambda, of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. On behalf of the Servant Leader Administration, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 22nd annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oracle Competition. This year, we are extremely blessed to have contestants speak to the same question that we pose this time of year. What would be the perspective of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. if he were alive today? Having the privilege to lead at such a tumultuous time in our generation's history does not fall short on the gravity of the fact that Martin Luther King Jr. navigated troubling waters during his time. The Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter serves the community on a daily basis, but it is at this time of year that we like to engage our youth and get their perspective. This year's competition will be unique and innovative as it will be virtual, but I can guarantee you that our contestants have poise, articulate, and they are beyond their age in terms of the sophistication on the message that they will deliver. I'd like to thank this year's co-chairs, brothers Mark Smith and brother Dr. Brian Agnew. I'd also like to thank the leaders of Alpha Alpha Lambda for all of their support in putting the event together. I'd like to thank our foundation committee. I'd like to thank our esteemed judges, as well as our sponsors. Thank you so much for your participation and your energy. We look forward to this event. I'd like to leave you with the motto of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. First of all, servants of all, we shall transcend all. Blessings. Also from Mount Vernon Elementary School in Newark is eighth grader Chisholm Ike. Good morning, everyone. 
My name is Chisholm Ike. I'm an eighth grader from Mount Vernon School located in Newark, New Jersey. It is my honor to speak to you as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with respect to his perspectives on the world today. Take a look outside. What do you see? In some neighborhoods, there is peace and quiet, whilst in others, there is pure chaos. Coincidentally, the peaceful neighborhoods are recognized as the suburbs and are predominantly Caucasian. Meanwhile, the chaotic neighborhoods are recognized as the hood or inner city areas and are usually inhabited by black and Hispanic people. Is this really a coincidence? I, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., did not fight for people to be grouped and separated by ethnicity, and I conveyed this through my many speeches and marches. I was always open to sharing my opinion, which made me an enemy of silence. As I once said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. As elucidated in the First Amendment, Congress is by no means able to limit our freedom of speech. And I'm not just talking to minorities. We need people of all races to join hands and exclaim phrases like Black Lives Matter, shout phrases like diversity is the future, and declare phrases like all men are created equal. Do not be afraid to speak up for what is right because your voice is just as important as the person sitting next to you. Many have suffered to get us to this point, but our journey is far from over. Because our words, if used correctly, can and will make a difference. Just look at Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. In the past, women were seen as incapable of reaching such heights. But she has just proved that the impossible can be possible if you are willing to work hard enough. On the other hand, however, throughout the United States of America, thousands of black and brown skinned students are not getting the necessary exposure to the best education in computer science and STEM fields. This is a major problem in the field of education that needs to be addressed immediately. How can minority groups of students assimilate into the current competitive higher levels of education and get access to better paying jobs if, do they not, if they do not get the necessary exposure to these critical fields of education at an early age? For instance, subjects like computer science and biology related science classes must be ongoing from the first through 12th grades if we are going to overcome the huge learning deficit that currently exists in the African American and other minority communities. Unfortunately, it seems this level of consideration only goes so far, as I have seen time and time again. Blacks are habitually treated unfairly. Sometimes, they are even beaten and killed with no penalization on the murderer or perpetrator. And it seems blacks are just one jelly bean in the entire jar. But I still have a dream. I am so very disappointed in the world today. The ideals I relentlessly marched and preached for haven't come true after all these years. Much to my chagrin, the ugliness of racism and its wicked pawns are still evident at work today. But guess what? I still have a dream. I still have a dream that we will one day not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. At one point, we were on track to winning the race, but suddenly it seemed that the proponents of the issue to root out racism got tired and disheartened, and so they stopped. Now may I ask why? Just imagine. Children are killed because you don't like how they look. It's shameful. Where is the freedom they promised us? We are still living in a corrupt world, but it is not too late to overcome. 
I am proud of the people who have been peacefully protesting for what is right and just. They are taking action to make sure our voice is heard. It is also true that some troublemakers riot and cause destruction, giving the peaceful protesters a bad name because of their atrocious behavior. But I know that those criminal elements do not define who we are and what we stand for. Rather, it diminishes the effectiveness of our fight. The big dream that I had has yet to be fulfilled. And we must work as hard as we can to cooperate and make that dream a reality. I leave you with these things to think on and hope you will open your eyes to what we have to change to fulfill my legacy. And remember, the time is always right to do what is right. In doing so, we will also learn the true meaning of peace, fairness, equality, and success. Let us accept the challenge to forge ahead and achieve our goals and dreams. Please join me on this journey. May God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Good day. I am Fred Davis, Managing Partner for Tax Services at Mitchell & Titus. Mitchell & Titus is the largest minority-controlled accounting firm in the U.S. Our commitment to excellence inspires our commitment to our clients and our community. Congratulations to the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated for pouring into these seven young men who are showcasing their oratorical skills today. To the seven young orators, Reverend Dr. King said in his Where Do We Go From Here speech, we must walk on in the days ahead with an audacious faith in the future. We at Mitchell and Titus walk with audacious faith because you seven young men are our future. Peace, blessings, and much love to you all. Coming to us next is Kamzi Kiki, a seventh grade student at the Farbrook School in Short Hills. His eye is my eye. This country was established as a free land. Land of the free, they called it. Of course, it wouldn't be called land of the free if it weren't for the Constitution, wouldn't it? I mean, Alexander Hamilton and his friends had the right idea, but was that really true for everyone? On September 17, 1787, this piece of important history was ratified, but at that time, slavery was still in effect. Now what is slavery? Easy answer, isn't it? You'd say, it's legal ownership of a person. And well, it's more familiar with blacks, you know, stuff like that. You're absolutely right. But what if I told you that slavery mattered the most in those days? This constitution, it didn't set them free. The whole purpose of the document was to inform people that citizens of the United States know that they had a voice. They themselves had the power to control the government. But did it give the slaves a voice? Hmm? Did it give all black suffering and barely clinging onto the soul of this nation a chance to speak up? It didn't look like it then, and it sure doesn't now. Those blacks had dwelt in aggressive nature for more than two centuries. For example, when heavy rains posed a burden on the overworked African Americans, some of their owners showed no mercy. When harsh sunlights desiccated the foreheads of those Negroes and their children, some of them were left to be sunbaked. Only those who had caring owners made it out alive. Some were indeed lucky. They may have had the guts to escape, but that action being no stranger to the hero Harriet Tubman, who led several groups of slaves to their light at the end of the tunnel. After the Civil War, an undaunted hero, in which we stand before today, passed the Emancipation Proclamation for slaves in the North. Slaves in the South were not immediately released from the chains of slavery. It took several years. As from the quote from the eminently popular speech of Dr. King, I have a dream, he says. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. He was right. It still is, however. A certain kind of system called Jim Crow laws was a definite problem for African Americans everywhere. Passed in the very late 1800s, Jim Crow laws made it sure that whites had a more premium vision than that of blacks. Segregation, they called it. Basically, whites getting the better stuff and blacks getting the worse stuff. Blacks and whites were not allowed to be in sync with each other. But now, more than half a century
century later, people are still unsatisfied with the so-called racial equality established many years ago. This is where my eye is locked on with Dr. King's eye. Dr. King was a shuffling speaker. He had experienced some intense situations during the Civil Rights Movement. The main problem was, of course, racism. But that wasn't the only thing Dr. King stuck up for. Government issues, economic equality, bus seating, stable housing conditions, and individual working conditions for employees were all things Dr. King lobbied for. But if Dr. King was still here, what would you think of the world today? That being the year of 2020. How would he describe it? This year has been a mysterious year when our God is placed. I don't know if he was still alive today, he would disagree with the problems set in place. For example, did the political pressure on COVID. Many people believe that wearing masks is one of the best ways to prevent, to prevent the spread of the disease, but other people disagree. Wearing masks is just asphyxiation in a nutshell, they say. If I get COVID, I get COVID. That's not gonna stop me from partying with my friends, as in a Twitter post. Dr. King would frown upon their sentiments. He would feel that masks are designed to save lives and protect people from fatal viruses and diseases. As Dr. King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? What exactly are we doing for others? Well, wearing masks is one of the most efficient ways to protect yourself and other people. We're also, we're also socially distancing ourselves from each other. Dr. King would most likely agree. He would do it too. Would he agree with the actions of our president? Our president really hasn't met the standards of what America expects a president to be. He has blatantly lied about several things we know weren't going to happen. Would Dr. King endorse that? No. I know he wouldn't endorse lying. Dr. King will endorse things that will be and always be beneficial to our country. As Dr. King said, History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the trident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. In closing, and the constant cries of the unsaved, the stuttering voices of the weak, the fiery wrath of riots, those are still voices. Those are still people who are unheard. They have not gotten their demands to make the world a better place. Dr. King is a perfect example of that. And the next time, you should go outside and feel the breeze, give thanks for what our God has given us, and any negativity in this world will be quelled by your voice, your actions. And if you can't, just envision yourself in King's shoes. Just think to yourself, what do you see, and how are you going to change it? And be the loudest person you can, just like Dr. King. Or would it be his perspective on the world today? And why not change it? Thank you. At this time, I have the honor to present to you the moral leader of our nation. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation 
and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize the shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note which every American was to fall out. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as the citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. From the 13th Avenue, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School in Newark hails eighth grader Joshua King. Good morning. My name is Joshua King, and I am an 8th grade student at 13th Avenue, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I would personally like to thank the brothers of the Alpha Alpha Lambda Chapter Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated for this opportunity. Today, I'll be sharing a speech on what Dr. Martin Luther King's perspective will be on the world today. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. fought for freedom and justice for all men, women, and children. He fought for equal rights for all, no matter who you were and where you came from. It was Dr. King's dream for all God's children to come together as one. Dr. King didn't care about the barriers between races. If he were alive today, he wouldn't care about the barriers that we put up. He would continue to live out his purpose, which was to bring the people together. If Dr. King were alive today, he would be very disappointed seeing the regression that is going on in our world today. The murder the brutality, the inequality, the systematic racism that is plaguing our society. If Dr. King were alive today, he would be disappointed with black on black crimes in our communities today. Black on black crimes is an issue in our society. Seeing how our black brothers and sisters are here killing each other and destroying their lives all because of money and for the name to be known. According to the statistics shown on ABC News, 90% of black people that are killed are killed by other black people. And 14.8% of white people that are killed are killed by black people. Meaning, our black brothers and sisters are just murdering each other. And this is scary because I'm an older brother of two younger siblings. And I want them to grow up in an environment where they can go outside and not be afraid of being attacked by their own race. If Dr. King were alive today, he would be disappointed with the inequality of our education system, seeing how we still don't have equal and adequate education that he fought so hard for. If Dr. King were alive today, he would be disappointed with how some areas are giving good supplies for education and how some others are not. If Dr. King were alive today, he would say, let all schools be equal and receive equal supplies. If Dr. King were alive today, he wouldn't just be disappointed with the regression. He would be uplifted and joyful with the progress that all God's children have made. He would be happy about the first African-American president of the United States of America. Barack Obama being the first ever African-American president was a big step for all people of color. This showed that we, the black community, are just as equal as any other race, and that we can accomplish just as much as any other race can. And because of that accomplishment, I can say yes, yes to whatever I choose to accomplish.
If Dr. King were alive today, he would still be inspiring young African-American males like you and me. You see, Dr. King and I both have the same dream. We want to see the world unite and complete the purpose we was given to on this earth from our Father in Heaven. Dr. King was a man of justice. He was accused of a crime of bringing the people together. And because of that crime, he was thrown in Birmingham jail. Instead of giving up, Dr. King kept working harder and harder to complete his goals of bringing the people together. Because he knew what he was fighting for was right. Dr. King once said, the time is always right to do what is right. Meaning, it is never too late to do the right thing. And if we the people do what is right, the world will be such a better place than it is now. Dr. King was such a great man that he sacrificed his life so that I won't have to be afraid of what tomorrow will bring, so that I can be able to go to any school of my choice, so that I can be able to go to any restaurant of my choice. And because of that sacrifice, I, Joshua King, will work as hard as I physically can to be a great man like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There are lots of things going on in the world right now, both good and bad. But if Dr. King were alive today, he would only focus on what is good and address what is bad, turning it into good. He will be proud about the first black female vice president of the United States of America. If Dr. King were alive today, he would encourage all men, women, and children to wear face masks and stay six feet away from each other. If Dr. King were alive today, he would want, he would want all ch children to work as hard as they can to complete school, even if it's virtual. If Dr. King were alive today, he would still have a dream, and that dream would be seeing the world unite and overcome the crisis that is going on in our world today. Dr. King once said, The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Progress doesn't happen in one day or one year. Sometimes we have to take a step back to take two steps forward. But sooner or later, progress will come. But today, the U.S. and the rest of the world are one step closer to progress. Dr. King was put on this earth for a purpose. He knew that his purpose was to make the world a better place. I want you to ask yourself, what is your purpose and what was you put on this earth to do? And how do you think you can continue Dr. King's legacy? Dr. King joined the Alpha Phi Alpha, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha, in 19, which was established in 1906. He was, and in honor of Dr. King and the fraternity, I'm going to give you all six seconds to think about it. I did one, two, three, four, five, oh six. I just to make the world a better place, or even if it's the littlest thing. I want you to share this message to those around you so that they can find their purpose and make the world a better place for future generations. May God bless us all. I am Tanya Branch, managing partner of Quintero's Prieto Wood & Boyer, the largest minority law firm in the U.S. with over 300 lawyers and 23 offices throughout the country. Our firm is proud to stand with the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha, the Alpha Alpha Landless Scholarship and Educational Fund, and its immediate past chairman, my friend, Brother Marvin Pettis, on the outstanding occasion of the 22nd annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oratorical Contest. It is crucial that our voice continue to be mentored by men such as yourselves because our future rests in the development of the next generation. To the contestants, you are the key to the success of our people and our nation. Continue to excel in school, go to college, and do the absolute best you can, continuing to make us all proud. Congratulations to you all. Thank you and good luck. Next up is Malachi Michelle, a seventh grader at Aquinas Academy in Livingston. Hello. My name is Malachi Joseph Michelle, and I'm here to give my speech on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s perspective on the world today. Before I start, I want to say a special thank you to the brothers of Alpha Phi, Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the Alpha Alpha Lambda Chapter, and also to my principal, Miss O'Neill, my teachers, and my school, Aquinas Academy, for giving me this opportunity and experience to use my voice. Furthermore, 
I'm blessed. Tell my parents and my coach for supporting me and guiding me through this process. Needless to say, I'm humbled to stand here before you today. Every year, we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in January. Some people will see it as a day off, but many people will see it as a day to honor him and remember him for what he did and for what he fought for. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. fought for equality and human rights for all Americans. He fought for everyone to earn fair, live in dignified of race, occupation, or social economic status. He fought against segregation. He fought against poverty in America. And he fought against America's involvement in the Vietnam War. And he promoted nonviolence during protests. And the list goes on. Although racism and racial injustice is still present in the world today, segregation has ended. But Martin Luther King Jr. has mentioned, quote, shallow understanding by people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding by people of ill will, end quote. So I kindly ask you the question, what would Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s perspective on the world be today? It will most likely be what my perspectives are and what I dream of. I dream of a world where someone like me does not have to be reminded not to go too far on a bike ride because his mother is always panicking whenever he's outside because he is a black boy. That's what I have to go through once I put on my helmet or even go outside and try to play basketball. I dream of a world where someone like me does not have to go to bed and overhear his parents talking about another innocent black man has died, killed, with no justice for them. Or how they are scared because the world is going to judge them because of their looks. Yeah, I'm getting older. I guess I'm falling out of that cute little boy stage. Instead, I'm looking more like a threat to some people. I dream of a world where someone like me does not have to hear that extra talk from his father reminding him he is a black boy. Don't do this. Make sure you do that. Wear this. Look out for this. Respond like this and this will happen. Every morning before I go to school, me and my father pray together. And he always reminds me of who I am and how I shall hold myself at all times. I dream of a world where someone like me does not have to go to school and experience being made fun of because of the color of their skin. That's what happened to me in my old school when I was the only black student in my class. One of my classmates decided to color part of his skin a black marker and told the class how he looks like me now. The whole class found it to be funny. But even though that happened, I dream of a world where someone like me does not have to watch his mother get interviewed by your neighbor because they live in a white neighborhood. And the mother is driving a nice car with four children inside. Yes, my mother is a black woman. It has four children. But she also has a graduate degree and a career. And so does my father. My parents work hard to be where they are. Lastly, I dream of a world that has equal rights and education for all individuals, that everyone can be treated with respect, and they do not have to be worried about being discriminated. My dream is possible. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream continues to be possible, and your dream is possible. But our dreams depend on you, me, and all of us. My perspective on the world today is full of adventure and opportunity. But I do feel and know that I have to work harder than some people for what I want in life as I get older because of the color 
of my skin. My dream, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, and your dream can become true by us continuing to share positive thoughts and stories, speaking up for what's right, and taking action and advocating for people who could not advocate for themselves. In closing, I challenge you to answer this question. How could you change the perspective of the war you see today? I see today. And what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was he today? Thank you for your time. What an inspiring and emotional event we've had thus far today. Each of these young men have delivered as expected inspiring words and reflections through their eyes of what Martin Luther King Jr. would think of the world today. You could never tell by looking at the news that our boys are capable of such intellectual thought and mental processing of current events as they would imagine it through the lens of the moral leader of the 21st century. I am encouraged and excited about the future after hearing these young men today and knowing that they are not just our future, but as they have proven today to be our present. It's truly an honor to co-chair this inspirational event. As with most events and activities in 2020, we did not know how, if, or when we'd be able to pull off a program as spectacular as this. We challenged ourselves to not just produce a program to fill in the gap, but make it best in class and a template to follow in the future. These young men have added to the excellence that we strive for within Alpha Phi Alpha, and each one of these young men have assured this program will be gold standard moving forward. Thank you so much for joining our program and continue to encourage these young men as we enjoy the final speaker and look forward to today's winner. Thank you and have a great day. Our final presenter, Zakir Witherspoon, is in the seventh grade at Marion P. Thomas Charter School in Newark. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Greetings to the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and guests. My name is Akil with the Spoon, and I am in the seventh grade at Mary P. Thomas Charter School, located in Newark, New Jersey. Allow me to address what Dr. King's perspective will be on the world today. When I look around, I see so many things that Dr. King will address directly. Take, for instance, the high rate of police brutality that continues to occur against black and brown people. During the Civil Rights era, Dr. King marched against the senseless beatings and killings of our brothers and sisters. Yet, in 2020, we are still getting killed for a hoodie like Trayvon Martin, for Southern Lucy's like Eric Gardner, while driving to a new job like Sandra Blinn, while sleeping in an apartment like Breonna Taylor, while jogging like Ahmed Arbery, while lying on the ground for eight minutes and 46 seconds like George Floyd. Why is this? Black Lives Matter is looked upon as a terrorist organization for saying black lives matter, while white hate groups get police escorts. If Dr. King were alive today, he'd be extremely upset that our nation is going in the opposite direction or to gender will one day become. A nation where everyone receive equal justice based off their character and not the color of their skin. If Dr. King were alive today, he would challenge the country's current leadership, especially President Trump, who seems unbothered by these vicious acts. He even seems to encourage racism. Why is this? If Dr. King were alive today, he would state, and I quote, our lives begin to end the day, we become silent about the things that matter. We can no longer sit here and allow the lynchings of black and brown bodies. And to those leaders 
who said they are worried about losing their political positions or big donors? Dr. King would tell them, I'm not interested in the power for power's sake, but I'm interested in the power that is moral, that is right, and that is good. If Dr. King were alive today, he would encourage the protesters to continue speaking out against police brutality, voter suppression, and economic injustice. He would use his words to remind us that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Today, as I speak to each of you, we are living in challenging times. Think about it. The government wants to eliminate health care for millions of Americans, whether the current occupant living in the White House gets a special cocktail treatment for COVID. At times like this, small businesses are going out of business while Wall Street continues to receive government funding for bailouts. Why is this? During this pandemic, Dr. King would want us to care for one another. Dr. King will ask the nation today, what are you doing for others? He'll remind us that giving back doesn't require a large sum of money. Anyone can be great because anyone can serve. We only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And if we ever plan on making America great, we must learn by living together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. If Dr. King were alive today, he would tell us to stay the course. As he stated in his I Have a Dream speech, we must never be satisfied until justice rolls down like a mighty stream. Let me remind you, in his height of activism, Dr. King was one of the most hated men in America, yet he stayed the course. So to the Black Lives Matter protesters, Dr. King would tell them to stay the course. He would tell them to not get discouraged by the fact that some people place more value on damaged property than they do on black lives. Stay the course. In conclusion, to the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, which Dr. King was a proud member of as well, thank you for showing seven young brothers that anything is possible. I believe Dr. Kim will look at each of us as young drum majors who are destined to do great things. Stay the course. Stay the course. Thank you. Wow. These young men are truly remarkable. Their passion, their words, their messages just bring such an energy and vibe of hope for our future. As we close our program, anyone who has worked on a production like this one knows that there are far more people behind the scenes than in front. So if I forget anyone, please know that it is not intentional. First, a very special thank you to my partner and co-chair of this year's competition, Brother Mark Smith. To our judges, a job none of us would want this year, Brother Marvin Pettis, Brother Leonard Jones, and Brother Paul Murdoch. A heartfelt thank you to the brothers, my brothers, of the Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated under the leadership of chapter president, Brother Deli Oladapo. These men remain committed to the city of Newark and greater Essex County with a mission to develop leaders, promote brotherhood and academic excellence while providing service and advocacy for our communities. This year, seven brothers went above and beyond to provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring to each of these finalists as they prepared. Brothers Earl Brown, Fred Davis, Jeff Dodson, Anthony Mack, Marcus Randolph, Cedric Thorbs, and William White, I think we would all agree that you sharpened the iron within each of these young men who brought it today. 
to everyone that stepped up during this pandemic to provide financial support for this worthy competition, an event that highlights the accomplishments of our young men during a time when it seems that we all hear about the problems, especially our Jewel Level sponsors, Mitchell and Titus LLP and Quinteros Prieto Wood and Boyer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To the production team, Brother Darvin Darling, Brother Will Davis, and Derek Williams, you gentlemen truly outdid yourself with today's broadcast from the headquarters of Leadership Newark. To all the guidance counselors, the teachers, the school principals, administrators who were thrown into the fire of virtual learning and still made time to encourage their students to stretch beyond their comfort zones to grow in new ways, we salute your commitment every day to molding our future generations. Now to the mothers, fathers, guardians, aunties, uncles, grandparents, family members, and friends, wherever you are, make some virtual noise for our seven finalists. To Noah, MD, Chisholm, Kamsi, Joshua, Malachi, and Zakir, there's a very special poem that has meant the world to me and many others that I'd like you to always hold close. It's titled If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiven minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Just, uh, all right, good. Did you get me? You got All right, so before we announce the winners, I want to thank each of the seven participants for a job well done. You guys were spectacular. Your dedication and hard work really shows as each of your presentations were spectacular, guys. Um, so, of course, we know that everybody's been here waiting for this moment. So, for the moment you've all been waiting for, we will start with our four honorable mention recipients, each receiving a medal and a cash award of $250. Alphabetically, Noah Akinoye, MD Chowdhury, Kamsi Kiki, and Joshua King. Congratulations, gentlemen. In third place, receiving a medal and a cash award of $450 and an ACES Chromebook, Zakir Witherspoon. Congratulations, Zakir. In second place, receiving a medal, a cash award, 
and of $500 and an ACES Chromebook goes to Malachi Michelle. Congratulations, Malachi. And this year's winner of the 22nd annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oratorical Competition, receiving the Belford B. Lawson Trophy, a cash award of $599, and an ACES Chromebook. Congratulations goes to Chisholm Ike. On behalf of the Alpha Alpha Lambda Scholarship and Educational Foundation, our chairman, Mark Hassel, and the board of directors, thank you uh, for joining us today for your continued support of our scholarship programs, our Evening of Elegance Gala, and of course, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oratorical Competition. As is the tradition in Alpha Phi Alpha, we end all events with our fraternal hymn. I now invite Brother Dr. Joey Jackson to lend his voice in the singing of the hymn, bringing today's inspirational event to a close. Thank you all for joining us. A fire fraternal spirit binds all the noble, the true, and courageous manly deeds, scholarship and love for all mankind are the aims of our dear fraternity alpha phi alpha the pride of our hearts and loved by us Dearly art thou, we cherish thy precepts, thy banner shall be raised. To thy glory, thy honor and renown, college days. Swiftly pass, imbued with memories fond, and the recollection slowly fades away. Our renown, a fire and dear fraternal bond. May they ever abide and with us stay. Alpha, Phi Alpha, the pride of our hearts and love by us dearly art thou. We cherish thy precepts, thy banner shall be raised. To thy glory, thy honor and renown. O Lord, may the true spirit of fraternity rule our hearts, guide our thoughts, and control our lives so that we may become, through thee, servants of all. Amen. One. It will be ours. When the war is won, we will be sure. We will be sure. Oh. No man, no weapon formed against just glory is destined. Everyday women and men become legends. Sins that go against our skin become blessings. The movement is a rhythm to us. Freedom is like religion to us. 
Justice is juxtaposition in us. Justice for all just ain't specific enough. One son died, the spirit is revisiting us. True and living, living in us. Resistance is us. That's why Rosa sat on the bus. That's why we walk through Ferguson with our hands up. When it go down, we woman and man up. They say stay down and we stand up. Shots we on the ground, the camera panned up. King pointed to the mountaintop and we ran up. One day when the glory comes, it will be ours. It will be ours. Oh, one day when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh.